Chapter 27, Second Year, A Birthday Engagement Friday 3rd of November, 1972 Sirius's 13th birthday did not fall on the full moon as his 12th had. He never told the others about the talking to he'd got from Remus. Not as far as Remus could tell anyway, but he did act slightly differently towards his friends. Whereas before he had sometimes treated Remus as a little bit of a pet project, amazed whenever Lupin exhibited independent thought, Sirius at least appeared to develop some some sensitivity towards two secondary marauders. The subject of Quidditch was still a sore one, and so on the morning of his second Hogwarts birthday, James had enough tact not to suggest a lunchtime flying session. Breakfast began with a round of happy birthday at the very tops of their voices, as had become tradition for the marauders by now. The Potters sent Sirius a huge basket of chocolates, while James had ordered half of Zonko's catalogue as a birthday present. Remus was a bit embarrassed to hand over his own gift. Some old copies of Melody Maker, an NME that he'd pinched over the summer. But Sirius was thrilled. One of them had an interview with Mark Bolan. They spent most of the breakfast turning the pages, the three pureblood wizards laughing at the static muggle photographs. Remus kept sneaking looks at Sirius, wondering if he looked any different now he was a teenager. Remus had wanted to be 13 for ages. It seemed to him a very mature, grand sort of age. He knew it was silly to think you could gain some kind of new wisdom overnight, but it was certainly an important milestone, whichever way you looked at it. Sirius was definitely holding himself in a slightly different way. Remus was sure. Unfortunately, The carefree morning ended there, as they finished their meal and were preparing to get up for their first lesson, History of Magic. Their passage out of the hall was blocked. Sirius, a stern voice said. Narcissa Black stood before them. At fifteen, she was taller than all four marauders. She was a fairly attractive girl, Remus thought, if a little pinched about the face. She didn't have her elder sister's mad look, and she had dyed and straightened her long hair so that it hung in gorgeous platinum sheets, which shimmered when they caught the light. She stood before them with her arms crossed, regular sulking at her side. Sissy? Sirius nodded in greeting. She flinched, but didn't chastise him. It's your birthday, she said. Well, I was aware. She rolled her eyes. It seemed she didn't have her sister's temper, either, which Remus was glad for. You're to eat with us this evening. Come and sit at the Gryffindor table if you absolutely have to. No, she narrowed her grey eyes. Your mother has given strict instructions. We'll eat privately, in the Slytherin common room, like last year. No! Sirius lost his newfound maturity and suddenly seemed very much a child, practically stamping his foot. I want to eat with my friends. You can eat with them any time you want, Narcissa snapped, her hands on her hips now. Birthdays are family occasions. Regulus looked at his feet, still standing just behind his cousin. Sirius was still annoyed, but finally nodded his assent. James placed a hand on his shoulder. A harmless gesture, but Regulus looked up and stared intently, as if they were doing something foul. Once a time had been set for dinner, the two Slytherin blacks left, and the marauders stared after them. James looked at Sirius. Bad luck, he commiserated. Want to bunk off lessons? Nah, Sirius shook his head. I'll just take a few dung bombs with me to dinner. We can see if that time bomb spell works. Perfect. Sirius was gone for a long while after dinner. James paced the dorm room, checking his watch every few minutes, and wondering out loud whether he ought to go and stand outside the dungeons and shout. We need to start working on your map again, Lupin, he said, running his hands through his already catastrophic hair. Get everyone tagged, so we know where they are at all times. We're a long way off that, Remus replied from his bed where he was reading a book. Still haven't mapped any of the East Wing. I can do some over Christmas. No. James stopped still in the middle of the room. You and Black are coming to mine for Christmas. 
Rima stared at him and swallowed awkwardly. James, I can't. You know I can't. James waved a hand, resuming his pacing. I'll sort it out with Dad, don't worry. Full moon's on the 20th, I checked. We can all hang out here until then and leave on the 21st. Remus was speechless, but it didn't matter. James decided quickly after that to don his cloak and go looking for Sirius. Peter, rather predictably, followed him, but Remus was enjoying his book and let them go. He lolled on the bed and thought about putting a record on. James and Peter had called for a ban on Bowie until the end of the year. But if they weren't in the room... At the beginning of the year, Remus had been so taken in by Sirius's excitement that he hadn't told him that he had known all about Ziggy Stardust. In fact, everyone in the muggle world, pretty much, had been talking about him all summer. Sometime in mid-July, Remus had sat in the rec room after tea with a few of the older boys to watch Top of the Pops. Their TV was still black and white, but Remus felt as though he had seen the performance in colour. David Bowie was like no one else he had ever seen before. All of them had sat staring with their mouths wide open as the slender, alien-looking man bopped across the stage in a patchwork leotard. He was pale as snow, his hair was long at the back and stuck up wildly on top. His eyes were arresting, one pupil larger than the other. He was wearing makeup. Remus had once wanted to know him and to be him. When David slung his arm around the tall, fair-haired guitarist, Remus' stomach had done an odd sort of flip, and as the two men sang into the same microphone, their cheeks pressed so close together, one of the St Edmund's care workers had marched over and turned off the television set. Nasty queers, he had said. Disgusting putting that sort of stuff on telly where kiddies might see it. Remus thought about it more than he wanted to. When the two other boys returned, it was with a white-faced Sirius. He looked worse than he usually did after an encounter with his family, closed off and utterly joyless. Even his eyes looked a little less bright, veering into grey. What's up? Remus stood up, concerned. It's terrible, Sirius said. Really, really terrible. Vile. The worst. Most unthinkable. Horrific. He threw himself onto his bed, face down. He's been like this since we found him in the dungeons, James explained. Nothing but objectives. Superlative objectives, Sirius corrected, muffled slightly by his pillow. Yeah, yeah, you're being dramatic, James sighed. He ran his fingers through his hair again. He'd be bored before he saw 30, Remus thought. Want to tell us why? Sirius rolled onto his back, staring up at the canopy of his bed. I'm getting married. What? James and Peter looked just as shocked as Remus, so at least he knew this wasn't a normal wizard thing. Narcissa told me, he nodded, still staring blankly upwards. Usually they wouldn't make a match until I was of age, like with Bellatrix, but Sissy says they've decided to tighten the reins in my case. Make a match? James sounded flabbergasted. The blacks don't still have arranged marriages, surely? Of course we do, Sirius heaved a sigh. Noble and most, ancient, etc., etc. They want to hold the betrothal ceremony next summer. I'm supposed to buck my ideas up in time for it. Then the wedding is happening as soon as I finish Hogwarts. Doubt you lot will be invited. That's mad. That's medieval. That's my mother, Sirius finished. Um, Remus felt rude interrupting, but his curiosity was getting the better of him. Who are you supposed to be marrying? Sirius sat up. That's the twist in the dragon's tail, isn't it? He said angrily. That's my mother's pièce de résistance. He pronounced the French beautifully, with a perfect accent. Even in his darkest rages, Sirius Black could enunciate. Who? Sissy. What? Narcissa, your cousin. Narcissa Black. Sirius nodded. His shoulders sagged. The closed-off look returned to his face, and he lay back down. Apparently, they're looking to rein her in too. A dromedeer, her sister, you know, the only normal one. She's pregnant, according to Sissy. 
They're closing ranks, trying to prevent any more dirty blood getting in. But there have to be other pure blood girls out there, James reasoned. And I thought she and that Malfoy creep were going out. They are, Sirius nodded. She's as pissed off about it as I am, believe me. Talk about wedded bliss. What about Regulus? James was asking. He looked as though his mind was working a mile a minute. What about him? Sirius said bitterly. Think he fancies her instead? She's quite pretty, Peter said meekly. Sirius gave him a look that could shatter glass. She's my cousin, you dolt. All right, James held an, up an authoritative hand. No need for name-calling, we're just trying to help. Remus couldn't see how exactly Peter was helping, but he bit his tongue and let James continue. I meant, did Regulus say anything? He was there, wasn't he? Not a word, Sirius glowered, and no one mentioned his brother again. Right, well, James pushed his glasses up his nose. We've got until next summer, and we've got Narcissa on her side, believe it or not, so I'd say it's not hopeless. You don't know what hopeless is until you've met my mother, Sirius said. And she doesn't know what a marauder is, James said firmly. Gentlemen, he looked at them each in turn. Remus could see exactly what was coming. We have a new mission. Chapter 28 Second Year Assumptions How on earth could you get yourself out of an engagement? Remus wondered to himself as he made his way down to the dungeons on Sunday evening. He was alone. Lily had asked him to check on the potion they were working on one more time before handing it in the next day. He personally thought it was overkill, but was also guiltily aware that Evans had so far done the lion's share of the work. Sirius's problem had been ticking away in the back of his mind all day. James had ch charged them all with coming up with a solution by Christmas. But Remus couldn't see what might be done. He'd never thought about engagement, or marriage, or family honour before. Those were all grown-up things. Thirteen-year-old boys certainly weren't supposed to worry about them. But then, he supposed, turning the final bend in the staircase, nor were twelve-year-old boys supposed to worry about transforming into monsters once a month. He sighed heavily, pushing the door to the potions classroom open. To his disgust, Severus Snape was in there already, stirring his own potion. Their eyes met, and Remus froze for a moment, before squaring his shoulders, raising his chin, and walking straight over to his own cauldron, choosing to ignore the other boy. He couldn't help but notice that his potion was a slightly different colour from Snape's, which couldn't be a good sign. Theirs was a bold royal blue, much darker than it ought to be. Snape had obviously noticed too. You need to add more lavender, he said nasally, not looking up from his stirring. At least another teaspoon. Yeah, right, Remus frowned, as if I'm going to take advice from you. I'm hardly going to ruin Lily's potion, am I? Snape spat back. Remus considered this. It was true that despite Severus's generally unpleasant demeanour, the only other thing the marauders knew about him was that he would do almost anything for Lily Evans. It was weird, but Remus wasn't one to judge anyone for being weird. He spooned in some more lavender and stirred. At once, the potion took on a paler, sky-blue hue, and a lovely dreamy aroma rose from it. Snape made a smug clicking noise with his tongue and closed the lid on his own cauldron, getting ready to leave. Hiya, Sev, a voice came from the doorway. Oh, Remus. It was Lily. She looked a bit embarrassed. Remus frowned. Thought we agreed I was checking it tonight. Um, yes, we did. I was just double-checking. Her usually pale cheeks were bright red. Didn't think I'd show up. Snape snorted on his way out. Remus fought the urge to throw a spoon at the back of his greasy head. Lily didn't notice. She had already crossed the room and was looking down into the cauldron. Well, you do get a lot of detentions, she said diplomatically. Severus swept out of the room. 
Oh wow, it looks so much better than it did this morning. Did you do something? Added more lavender. Really? Nice one. It looks exactly right now. Well, he rubbed the back of his head, glancing at the door. Snape was out of earshot. Yeah, I just thought it needed some, I suppose. Nothing left to do then? Are you on your way back to the common room? Yeah. They walked together. Lily was in a good mood. We work quite well together, don't we? She smiled at him. It's a nice change from Sev, anyway. You're much more easygoing. Remus had never thought of himself as easygoing before. It was a nice thing for her to say. But then, compared to Snape, anyone might seem relaxed. What's the thing with you and him, anyway? He asked. He's my best friend, Lily answered promptly. As if she had to justify this all the time. As if she had to justify this all the time. We've known each other for ages. Oh, right. He's not as bad as you think he is, she said, glancing at him sideways. He can be really kind and funny. Why does he hang out with Mulciber and the pureblood lot then? Well, if we're going to base our assumptions on people based on their friends, Lily looked at him very pointedly. What's wrong with my friends? Remus was shocked. Everyone loved James and Sirius. Lily rolled her eyes. They're all heirs to pureblood houses, aren't they? She tossed her auburn curls. Plus, they're massive show-offs. Potter thinks he's God's gift. And Black is... well, he's a Black, isn't he? Even I know about them. And I'm muggle-born. I suppose Peter's okay, but it's sad the way he follows them around everywhere. I follow them around too. Yeah, you do. She looked at him again, cheekily. You're wrong about them, Remus said. I mean, okay, you're right about them showing off, but they're not just... There's more to them. Well, then you'll just have to accept that there's more to Severus, won't you? She was harder to argue with than Sirius. Remus shrugged, non-committantly. It occurred to him that Lily might be able to help with their present conundrum. After all, weddings and engagements were girls' things, weren't they? At least she might offer another perspective. Evans, he said thoughtfully, you're quite clever. Oh, cheers very much. Sorry, I mean, you're cleverer than me. Much better. He grinned, rubbing the back of his head. What would you do if your family was making you get married to someone you didn't want to? She frowned, as if that was not at all what she had expected. Like an arranged marriage? I thought you lived in a foster home. A children's home, he corrected. They're different. Anyway, it's not me. It's someone else. Um, she looked stumped, which didn't give Remus much hope. Gosh, I mean, it's not something my parents would ever do. But if they did, I'd be really angry, obviously. And hurt. Hurt? He asked, puzzled. Well, obviously, your parents are supposed to love you and want what's best for you. Making a decision like that on your behalf is the complete opposite. Right, he nodded, though he didn't really understand. Well, this person, uh, doesn't really get on with their parents anyway. Even so, Lily shrugged, that doesn't mean they're not hurt by it. You should be able to trust the people who raised you. Oh, okay. Remus didn't know what to say to that. He had a horrible churning sensation in his stomach. The same feeling he used to get when called upon to read out loud. Lily hadn't noticed. They were almost at the common room now. I still don't know what I'd do, she sighed. It's like the only option is to defy them, the parents. That's going to cause all sorts of problems. Who is it about? Go on, tell me. Remus shook his head. Can't, sorry. Lily nodded, understanding. Remus smiled at her. She had an immensely soothing presence. Flibbity gibbet, Lily said to the portrait, which swung open for them to crawl through. James had not long returned from Quidditch practice and was still in his red flying robes. 
He sat on one of the sofas, flicking Zonko's bursting beans into the fireplace, where they burst into a riot of colour like miniature fireworks. Sirius lay on the rug beneath him, reading a book on hexes he'd brought from home. All right, Lupin? James grinned. Remus nodded to Lily and went over to his friends. The redhead went straight up the stairs to the girls' dawns. Dumped us for Evans, have you? James asked, smirking. Potions, Remus replied. Right. You friends with her now? Sort of, Remus shrugged. She's all right. Hates you too. What? They both sat up, looking affronted. But everybody likes us, Sirius said. We're lovable rogues. She thinks you're show-offs. James gasped dramatically. How dare she? We'll have to win her over. Why bother? Sirius rolled over, returning to his book. She's friends with Snivellus. She clearly has no taste. Did she really say that? James was asking Remus. He nodded. She said, you think you're God's gift. What does that mean? It's a muggle expression, Remus explained. Means she thinks you're full of yourself. She thinks that? Well, Remus looked at him. You sort of are, to be honest. James laughed. Remus sat beside him, grabbing a handful of the Zonko beans himself and fling flinging them into the fire, one by one. He and James shortly made a game of it, seeking who could create the biggest explosions by hitting the embers just right. Forgot to say, James said, once the bag of beans was empty. Got an owl from Dad today. He's spoken to McGonagall and got permission for us to have you over Christmas. What? Really? Remus was fascinated. Why would a grown-up, who had never met him before, want to intervene on his behalf? He made a mental note never to underestimate the power of James's will ever again. Yeah. Doesn't think he can get you for the summer, though. Sorry. Remus shook his head wordlessly. He ought to say thank you, but he hardly knew how. Just waiting for you now, mate, James nudged Sirius with his foot. Have you sorted it out with your mum? Say you're going to the Pettigrews again. Not bothering, Sirius replied, still reading. Just going to go to yours without saying anything. Sirius was very rarely in contact with his parents, but since the Narcissa development, he had been ignoring their owls altogether. Remus wasn't sure that silence was the best way for Sirius to express his discontent, but as Lily has just reminded him, Remus knew very little about fam families. Mum won't like it, James chewed his lip. Don't tell her then. Sirius turned his page. James and Remus exchanged a look. They had to do something about the engagement soon. The thought of Sirius being in this mood for five more years was a very grim one, indeed. Chapter 29, Second Year December Moon. The Hogwarts Express left Hogsmeade Station for Christmas on Saturday the 16th of December that year, meaning that once the full moon had passed, James, Sirius and Remus had to find other means of getting to the Potter's family home. McGonagall, after lecturing Remus on not letting any other students in on his secret, was sympathetic to the Marauder's wish and allowed them to use the flu connection in her office just this once. Remus didn't mind the lecture so much, but he was terrified of using the flu network for the first time. He'd heard all sorts of horror stories from fellow students, and it didn't help that he was usually queasy for a few days after the full moon, anyway. Sirius received a howler every morning after the 16th, demanding that he come home at once. But he simply tossed the scarlet envelopes into the fireplace, where Walpurga black screams echoed up the chimney stacks. James was clearly unnerved by his behaviour, but didn't say anything. Sirius was always up for a fight lately, and it was just better to steer clear. Unfortunately, as the full moon drew nearer, Remus also had a very short fuse. The two boys bickered over anything and everything, and poor James had to step between the pair more than once. Just write back to her, for God's sake, Remus groaned on the morning of the 20th, throwing a pillow at Sirius from his bed. He'd been woken early for the third morning in a row by a howler. 
If you think you can escape your birthright in this cowardly fashion, then you have another thing coming, it wailed, echoing through the Gryffindor Tower like a banshee. Stay out of it, Lupin, Sirius flung the pillow back at him. How am I supposed to stay out of it when it's in our bloody bedroom every morning? Remus growled, getting up now. Well, I'm so sorry to inconvenience you, Sirius retorted, dripping with sarcasm. He looked rough, as if he hadn't slept properly at all. But Remus was in too much of a bad mood to care, and his transformation was only hours away. How about not acting like a spoilt brat for five minutes? He snapped. You're so bloody selfish. I'm not asking her to send them. At least I actually get post. At least people actually care enough about me. Remus threw himself on top of Sirius and began thumping him as hard as he could, incandescent with rage. Shut up, he grunted, landing a decent punch right on Sirius's left cheek. Sirius, though extremely apt at insults, was not much of a fighter. He gasped and tried to punch Remus away, eventually grabbing it for his wand. Mordio, he hissed, aiming at Remus's face. At once, Remus let go, tumbling backwards onto the bed, clutching his forehead. A horrible stinging sensation radiated from the spot Sirius had cursed. You wanker, he yelled, feeling his face tightening and swelling up. You deserved it. Sirius! James had clambered out of his bed too late. You cursed him! You bloody cursed him! Sirius was looking less sure of himself now. He started it. He didn't even have his wand on him. Remus had climbed off the bed and was staring at himself in the wardrobe mirror. He looked as though he had rolled through a stinging nettle bush backwards. His skin was red and shiny, taut and swelling at ro a worrying rate. Does it hurt? James asked, tentatively. Remus shook his head, though it did, a lot. I'm going to the hospital wing, he said. Don't come with me, he snapped seeing James pulling on his dressing gown. As he marched out of the room, still in his pyjamas, he heard James mutter. Attacking someone who is unarmed is really fucking low, Black. Madame Pomfrey healed him quickly, using the counter jinx, but she was very annoyed about it. Who did it? she asked him. If it was Potter or Black, then I want to hear about it. I told Minerva it was a bad idea to let you go away for Christmas. Why shouldn't I go? Remus asked, scandalised. Sirius is going. Mr Black doesn't have your limitations. But we're not going till tomorrow. It's right after the full moon. That's the safest. I'm thinking of your health, Remus. You're very fragile. I am not fragile, Remus seethed. Of course not, dear, she said, not really listening to him. Sit there quietly for a bit, hm? Have you had breakfast? Madame Pomfrey made him stay in the hospital wing all day in his pyjamas. The Medi-Witch had been working on a new potion that she hoped might make his transformation smoother. She let him borrow some of her books, so it wasn't too bad. But he felt like an invalid all the same. His face was still a bit tingly from Sirius's curse, though the swelling had gone down substantially. It might be a good one to use on Snape, he made a mental note to remember to ask Sirius exactly how he'd done it. At about one o'clock, just after lunch, James and Sirius came to see him. Madame Pomfrey gave them a sound telling off first. Cursing your fellow housemate. Cursing your dorm mate, for goodness sake. In my day, you would have been flogged. And Professor McGonagall has informed me that you know about his special circumstances. One might think you'd have more sense. James made copious apologies, and Sirius, who barely flinched at his mother's obscene chastisements any more, hung his head looking utterly ashamed. Eventually, Remus guessed that this must have been enough to satisfy the school nurse, who allowed them over to see him. They stood at the end of the bed like mourners, barely meeting his eye. "'We're really sorry, Remus,' James started. Remus clicked his tongue. You never did anything. James kicked Sirius, who looked up too. I'm really sorry, Remus. 
He had a heavy dark bruise high on his left cheek, and his eyes looked a little over bright. Remus wondered if Sirius had cried about it. The thought made him feel funny. He shook his head, no longer angry. I started it. Sorry I hit you. Sorry about the howler. Sorry your mum's a nightmare. Sorry you're a werewolf. They both laughed, and everything was forgiven. Will she let you out now? James asked. Few hours, still, till the moon. Remus shook his head. Nah, she wants to try some new potion. I didn't know there was a cure. There isn't, Remus said quickly. This is just a... I think it's to make the transformation, you know, easier. They both looked at him puzzled. He shifted uncomfortably. Like a painkiller, I think. Muggles' wands don't work. Does it hurt, then? Sirius asked, cocking his head. Now that the storm had passed, he was back to seeing Remus as an interesting specimen. Well, yeah, Remus frowned. He had assumed they knew a lot more than him, having grown up in the wizarding world, so he was surprised they didn't know about the pain. For a long time, the pain was the only thing he had known. To his surprise and delight, James and Sirius elected to stay in the hospital wing with Remus for the rest of the afternoon. They played a few rowdy games of exploding snap before Madame Pomfrey sternly told them to quiet down, so they switched to gobstones. As the evening drew in, they didn't go down for dinner, but ate the same hospital food as he did. This was no great thing for them. James and Sirius treated it as any other afternoon. The hospital bed was just an extension of their dorm. For Remus, it was everything. It was time that would otherwise be spent anxious and alone. It was the closest thing to family he could imagine. McGonagall came and chased them out, eventually, ready to lead Remus to the shack. He went peacefully, with a soft smile on his lips and laughter still echoing in his ears. Madame Pomfrey's painkilling potion had no effect, but Remus found the transformation slightly more tolerable, all the same. James and Sirius arrived first thing the next morning. Remus was dozing in his bed, having been brought back into the castle at dawn. His face hurt, and he knew it wasn't from the curse anymore. Madame Pomfrey had left a hand mirror on his bedside table, glass down, but he had been too tired to look yet. He was woken by the sharp gasp of breath which came from either James or Sirius. He wasn't sure who. When he opened his eyes, they had both rearranged their expressions into stoic cheer. All right, mate, James said, with a half smile, as you might address a child. All right, Remus croaked, hauling himself up. It must be bad. He lifted the heavy mirror and turned it towards his face. Ah. The cut looked half healed already, thanks to Pomfrey's ministrations, but it was still a shock. The scab was hard and black, edged with tender red skin. It stretched from the inner corner of one eye, up over the bridge of his nose, diagonally down towards the centre of his opposite cheek. He couldn't remember much, but it looked as though he'd almost split his face wide open. My beautiful face, he said weakly, attempting sarcasm, but feeling dreadful. Now everyone would know. So far, He'd been able to hide the worst of his scars under his robes, but he knew now that it had only been a matter of time before his luck ran out in that regard. It's not that bad, James said quickly. It'll heal really fast, I bet. How did... Sirius began, but was interrupted by Madame Pomfrey, who came storming over. You two back again! They stepped back, sharply, as if frightened of her showing reverence they never showed for McGonagall. The nurse pulled the curtain around Remus's bed, closing it in their faces. Ah, you've had a look, have you? She addressed Remus now, in a much softer tone. I know it looks bad, but it'll pale just like the other ones. Should be barely noticeable by the new year. Remus somehow didn't believe her. Even his most faded stars were still very noticeable. She took a closer look, then smoothed the clear ointment over the cut. Take this with you, she instructed, 
handing him the jar, apply every morning and evening. Does it hurt still? He shook his head. She clucked her tongue, sceptically. Well, even so, it might itch a bit as it heals. Perhaps we could try trimming your nails down next month. Though, I suppose the claws come in anyway. She sighed, sounding frustrated. Your face must still have been irritated even after we got the swelling down. It's fine. Rima shrugged her off. He was keenly aware of his friends on the other side of the curtain and wanted her to go away. Can I go now? I feel okay. Wouldn't you rather a bit more sleep? No. He shook his head, vehemently. I'm hungry. I want to go down for breakfast. He knew that would work. She was always on at him to eat more. Well, fine. Get dressed and off you pop. Sirius was very quiet during breakfast, leaving James and Remus to maintain the conversation, something neither of them had m much practice at by themselves. Once fed, they went upstairs to pack because Sirius and Remus had left it to the last minute. James, frustrated by their lack of foresight, marched to McGonagall's office to see if everything was ready for their journey, leaving them to it. Remus packed a few things. He hadn't got the others any presents, and he'd made them all promise not to get him any either. It wasn't fair. Matron had sent ahead a small package, so there was that. He threw in some clothes. The others probably wore robes at home, but the only robes Remus owned were his school uniform. And he wasn't sure he actually owned that, or whether it was just on loan. So he shoved in his mother muggle clothes. Packed, Remus turned to find Sirius standing directly behind him, looking even worse than he had the day before. What's up? Remus asked, startled. It's my fault, Sirius replied, his voice strangely flat. I heard Pomfrey say so. Huh? Your face. I cursed it. Then when you turned, you scratched it. Oh! Remus raised his fingers to his face self-consciously. Sirius looked away. It's not really your fault, Remus said awkwardly. I mean, I scratch everywhere else too. Bound to happen eventually. Why do you do it? Sirius had asked that once before, when looking at his old scars. This time, Remus could tell that he really understood what he was asking. But Remus still didn't un have an answer. I don't know. I don't remember. You don't remember anything at all? Not really. I know I'm always hungry, like I've been starving all my life. And angry. About what? Remus shook his head. Just angry. I'm so sorry, Remus. Sirius looked sad again. Remus couldn't bear it. Oh, shut up, he said, half joking. You wouldn't think twice about cursing James or Peter. Yeah, but you're... Don't say it. He'd been afraid this might happen. Please don't treat me like I'm sick or different or whatever. It's one night a month. If I punch you, you're allowed to curse me, okay? Sirius looked like he wanted to laugh. Are you saying you're planning to punch me again? Rumours threw a sock at him. If you don't sort out those bastard howlers, maybe... Travelling by flu powder was nothing compared to feeling your own spine elongate every month, and Remus wasn't sure what all the fuss had been about. He was the second to step out of the fireplace into the potter's lounge after James. Brushing soot from his shoulders, he quickly hopped off the heath rug to make room for Sirius, and watched as James was pulled into a hearty embrace by both of his parents. Mr and Mrs Potter were quite a bit older than Remus had imagined, but both had kind, merry faces that shared familiar features with their son. Mr. Potter's hair was white as snow, but stuck up at every angle, exactly like James's. Mrs. Potter had his winning smile and warm hazel eyes. They both hugged Sirius too, while Remus shrank back, feeling horribly out of place. Finally, Mrs. Potter turned her sunny smile on him, Thankfully, she did not make to hug him too, perhaps in sensing that he was uncomfortable. She simply nodded at him gently. Hello, Remus. 
We've heard ever so much about you. I'm so glad you're spending Christmas with us. Remus smiled back shyly, but couldn't bring himself to speak. It didn't matter. James and Sirius were chattering nineteen to the dozen with Mr Potter, who looked like a schoolboy himself, eyes twinkling with fun and mischief. The sitting room. Remus supposed it was a sitting room, as it had three sofas in it, was the biggest he'd ever seen, with wide, tall windows letting in soft winter sunlight that pooled onto the polished hardwood floors. A gigantic Christmas tree stood in one corner, glimmering with silver dust and surrounded by a mountain of brightly wrapped presents. Paper chains and streamers were draped across the ceiling and along the picture rails, and even the magical portraits had decorated their frames with fairy lights. As they were led through the house, For goodness sake, Fleamont, let the boys put their things away before you start planning whatever it is I know you're planning. He found that every room, even the hallways, were decorated with lights, tinsels and hundreds and hundreds of festive cards. The Potters must be very popular wizards indeed. They were certainly wealthy. The sweeping mahogany staircase continued up three more flights. James's bedroom was big enough for all three of them, bigger than their dorm room at Hogwarts, with a king-sized four-poster bed. But Remus was surprised to find that there were four equally large rooms which were unoccupied. Sirius had already claimed the one next to James, so Remus put his bag in the third room, wondering what it would be like to sleep alone for the first time. Come on then, lads, Mr Potter yelled up the stairs in a booming voice. It's been snowing all afternoon, and I've got the toboggans ready. Chapter 30, Second Year, Christmas with the Potters Remus had thought that nothing could be much better than Christmas at Hogwarts, which was, quite literally, magical. Christmas at the Potters, however, was an entirely different experience that seemed only to get better. First, there was tobogganing down the snowy slopes in the back garden, though, at over 500 acres, no one could really call it a garden. Peter, who lived further down in the main village, came out to join them as soon as he heard they had arrived. And they had an extremely noisy and violent afternoon, careering down the hillside and playing complex war games with snowball ammunition. Mr Potter even joined in, sprightly for his age, with the considerable advantage of being able to use magic. Mrs Potter called them in for lunch and made them all change out of their freezing wet clothes. They sat by the fireplace, warm and dry, eating hot toasted tea cakes, smeared in rich yellow butter. In the afternoon, they wanted to go out again, but Mr Potter had gone to lie down, and Mrs Potter didn't want them to go out so close to nightfall. Instead, they helped her decorate an enormous Christmas cake with white royal icing and tiny magical figurines. Then, to wrap presents for the neighbours and their house elves. We never got anything for the house elf, Sirius said, matter-of-factly, his fingers hopelessly bound up in some spellow tape. Mind you, Creature's a moody git. I doubt he wants anything. They'll take gifts as long as it's something edible, I find, Mrs Potter replied, smiling. No clothes, of course. That only upsets them. Tell Mum what your lot does to house elves, Sirius, James grinned binding his friend's hands up even more. Sirius laughed, lightly. Mounts their heads, he said. Once they're dead, at least. I think we wait until they're dead. Creature's the only house off I remember. Goodness, said Mrs Potter. I had rather thought that tradition had died out. Not with the blacks, Sirius sighed. Remus could tell that he was thinking about the betrothal again. You're making a lovely job of that, Remus, Mrs Potter observed, glancing over at the book he was wrapping for Mrs Pettigrew. Unlike some naughty boys I could mention. She turned a stern gaze upon her son and his best friend, now attempting to take their hands to the tabletop. Remus smiled at her, politely, feeling the fresh cut on his face pull at his skin. He still hadn't really said anything to either of James's parents yet. He'd always been told to be seen and not heard around older people, and he had never had been to a friend's house before. Sirius, by contrast, 
was completely at ease. Rumours had never seen him happier. He dotted on Mrs Potter as if she was his own mother. If he liked his own mother, of course. Rumours yawned, more widely than he meant to, trying to hide behind his hands, ducking his head in embarrassment. He had only slept a few hours that morning following the moon, and an afternoon of snowball manoeuvres had left him exhausted. "'You'd better go up to bed, dear,' Mrs Potter said, ignoring the fact that it was only three o'clock in the afternoon. Remus wondered if James had told his parents about him. They must know. McGonagall might not have let him come otherwise. "'Oh, you're all right, aren't you, Lupin?' Sirius cajoled. "'Peter's coming back in a bit. We can go out again.' Remus blinked at him, then looked at James for help. "'Leave him alone, Sirius,' Mrs Potter chided. "'The poor boy's dead on his feet. "'Come on, dear. Off you go.' Gratefully, Remus got up off the kitchen table and made his way to the bed. As he changed into his night things, he couldn't help but steal another glance at himself in the mirror, now that he was properly alone. Perhaps it was having been out in the cold, but the scar looked worse than it had that morning the contrast harsher with his pale skin. Would his face always surprise him now? Would he always be catching a glimpse of himself somewhere, in a mirror or shining surfaces, and jump? Would other people be afraid of him? There was a soft tap at the door, just as Remus was about to put on the ointment Madame Pomfrey had given him. It was serious. Remus caught his scent before he even knocked. All right, the dark-haired boy crept inside, speaking quietly. He held a pewter goblet in his hand. James's mum sent you this. It's a healing draught, I think. Oh, thanks, Remus nodded tiredly. Sirius set it on the bedside table. You okay? Fine, just tired, mate. Were we too, you know, rough or something? No. Remus said, very firmly, probably sounding angrier than he meant to. It's nothing to do with you two. It's just the fact that I was up all night howling at the bloody moon and trying to rip my own face off. I'm tired. Remus had to sit down. The effort of the outburst made him dizzy. Sorry, Sirius said, even more quietly. It was the second time he'd apologised that day, and Remus hated the sound of it. I'll leave you. He closed the door. Remus couldn't bring himself to start worrying about hurting Sirius's feelings. He smeared on some of the ointment, then sniffed the goblet Mrs Potter had sent. He recognised it as something he'd had before at Hogwarts, which would trigger sleep. Getting into bed, he drained it quickly and closed his eyes. The remaining days before Christmas passed quickly, and Remus was able to experience real family life for the first time. Mr and Mrs Potter had to be the perfect parents. They were kind and sure, always smiling and full of fun. Remus hadn't known that adults could be that way. He hadn't known that people could grow up like that. It was clearer than ever why James was the way he was, as brimming with love and blind confidence as Remus was brimming with rage. It was obvious, too, why Sirius was so drawn to the family. He had an unquenchable thirst for love, and the Potters had an endless supply. The four boys tramped all over the surrounding countryside in the snow, bundled up in their warm Gryffindor scarves, hats and gloves. In the evenings, they played card games, helped Mrs Potter prepare dinner, and listened to Mr Potter telling ghost stories around the fireplace. They made mince pies and paper chains, They built snow wizards and igloos, and they slept so soundly in their beds at night that not even a howler could have woken them up. Unfortunately, it was not to last. While the blacks had stopped sending howlers, they had not forgotten their wayward son, and tried a new tact on Christmas Eve, with devastating consequences for the marauders. They were drinking warm butter beer and sitting on the hearth rug. James and Sirius were playing gobstones very loudly, and Mr Potter was teaching Remus to play chess. The old man had been horrified that Remus didn't know how, and Remus was surprised to find himself actually quite enjoying the game. 
The whole room felt warm and safe, heavy curtains drawn against the cold and dark, tree lights twinkling softly and the fire popping and crackling beside them. The clock had just struck nine and Mrs Potter was keen to send them all to bed when there was a loud crack just outside the window. Mr and Mrs Potter shared a quick glance and Remus's ears pricked like a dog. The smell of spent magic permeated the air like burnt toast, something dark and unsavoury. There was a firm, hollow knock at the door. Weren't expecting anyone, were we, Effie? Mr Potter frowned slightly at his wife. She shook her head and they both listened. The Potter's house elf, Gully, went scampering towards the front door to answer it. There were stilted voices in the hall and Gully came hurrying in. Oh, Mr Potter, Mr Potter, she's come for young Master Black. She's telling me it's his mother. I told them to wait there for you. The house elf was wringing his hands anxiously, clearly very confused by his turn of events. Sirius and James looked at each other. Sirius's face was white. He looked like he might be sick. She wouldn't, he whispered. Mr Potter was already up and out of the door. There were raised voices in the hallway now. Remus recognised Mrs Black's sharp tone from her horrid letters. Sirius, Mrs Potter said gently, did your parents give you permission to visit us, dear? He looked at the floor. She clucked her tongue. Oh, sweetheart, she said, sounding very sad. Don't make him leave, Mum. James stood up. He hates them. They're his parents, James. Sirius, Mr Potter called from the hall. Sirius got up. James did too. Remus didn't want to. He wanted to stay by the fire where they'd all been so happy just moments beforehand. But Mrs Potter had stood up too, and this was one of those times the marauders had to present a united front, no matter how frightening Sirius's mother was. They all filed out into the hall. Remus had seen Mrs Black once before, the first time he'd boarded the Hogwarts Express. Back then, he had simply thought she looked very severe, and that she looked like Sirius. She still looked severe. Her hair was slicked back and pulled up in a high bun which coiled like a serpent at the crown of her head, fixed with an emerald pin. Her eyes were dark, not as blue as Sirius's, but she had that black family bone structure and superior look. She was shorter than Mr Potter, but still managed to gaze at him as though he was filth on her boot. Her look sharpened as she saw James and Rem Remus appear. Sirius, she said coldly, narrowing her eyes at her eldest son. You will come with me at once. Creature? She snapped her fingers and an old wizened looking house elf emerged from behind her robes. Go upstairs and fetch Master Black's things. The house elf bowed deeply, kissing the silver cap toe of Mrs Black's pointed boots and scurrying upstairs. Good evening, Walperga, Mrs Potter said, pleasantly, as if there was no tension at all. May I offer you a drink? We, we were just about to crack open the mince pies, weren't we, boys? Mrs Black ignored her, looking straight at Sirius. Put on your cloak, we're leaving now. But mother, I... Don't you dare speak to me, she hissed, eyes flashing. Remus wanted to run away. She was worse than Matron, one hundred times over. She was worse than Bellatrix and Snape, and every nasty person he had ever met. The thought of letting Sirius go with her made his insides twist. Mr and Mrs Potter seemed to be suffering from the same crisis. Walperga, oh, why not let him stay? Mrs Potter tried. I know he's been a bit naughty, but there's no harm done. We can have him for lunch and send him back before dinner tomorrow. They've all been having such a nice time together. Mrs Black let out a short, cackling laugh, as if her son's enjoyment was the least of her concerns. She eyed James, her gaze raking over his mess of hair, then Remus, staring pointedly at his new scar. Remus looked at his feet, terrified. She'd know. She'd know straight away. Creature came scuttling back down the stairs, followed by a very affronted-looking gully. 
Cirrus's trunk hovered behind them both, apparently packed and ready to go. Walpurga turned. Come along, Sirius. No, he said, quietly but very firmly. Rumours wanted to tell him to shut up. Couldn't he see how much trouble he was in? But Sirius was clenching his fists, looking at his mother. I want to stay here, with the Potters. You can't make me... Silencio! Walpurga spun round, jabbing her wand at Sirius. He stopped speaking at once, though not voluntarily. He opened and closed his mouth a few times, and nothing came out. She had stolen his voice. Walpurga, really? Mr. Potter gasped, as Mrs. Potter let out a small shriek and knelt beside Sirius, wrapping her arms around him protectively. He's just a boy. He is my son, Walpurga purged, looking daggers at Mrs. Potter. And he is heir to the finest house in Britain. He will learn his place. Come, Sirius. Sirius looked completely defeated, his mouth a straight line of resignation. He hugged Mrs. Potter back, then stepped away from her. He gave James and Remus a small wave before following his mother out of the door. The four of them stood in silence after the front door slammed. Remus wondered if James felt ashamed as he did. They ought to have stood up for their friend in some way. What would happen to him now? Mr. Potter looked furious. Using a silencing charm on her own son? On an underage wizard? It's morally reprehensible. She does worse than that, James said quietly. Remus nodded, in agreement, feeling as though someone had taken his own power of speech. We'll have to make the house unplottable, Fleeman, Mrs. Potter said suddenly. Make it so that we can't be found. You said you were considering it after the last election. I don't want that dreadful woman in my house ever again. Mr. Potter nodded, darkly. I'll look into it in the new year. Alistair Moody owes me a favour. Bedtime, boys, Mrs. Potter said, her voice trembling. Try not to worry too much. She hugged James fiercely, kissing him on both cheeks. Remus tried to dodge her, but she grabbed him too, pulling him into a tight embrace. She smelled like oranges and clove. Psst! Remus! Remus had just finished brushing his teeth and was making his way down the hall to his room when James poked his head out and ushered him into his own bedroom. They knelt on the bed together. James withdrew a note from his pyjama pocket. Regulus sent this. What does it say? Remus asked quickly, before James could give it to him to read. Oh, um, it says, Sirius is home, do not try to contact him. That's all? That's all. James nodded grimly. Nice or Regulus, Remus remarked, looking down at the note, which was obviously very hastily scribbled down. Thought they hated each other. Yeah, well, they're still brothers, aren't they? James replied, shrugging. Family ties and all that. Do you think he'll be okay? I don't know. James chewed his lip. I never got to give him his present, and he said he never gets anything Christmassy from his lot, just family heirlooms and stuff. I had a go at him the other day, Rumus sighed dolefully, about, you know, my little furry problem. James chuckled. Don't worry about it. You two are always having a go at each other about something. Just your personalities. Oh, do you think? Remus was a bit miffed by that observation. Sirius snapped at Peter far more often. Surely. James grinned. I told you. Don't worry about it. Black loves an argument. Christmas morning was a subdued affair, though the Potters were keen to make it cheerful, if only for Remus. He was embarrassed to find a bulging stocking at the foot of his bed when he woke up, and resolved to correct this next year somehow. There were the customary socks and underpants from Matron, plus a tin of shortbread, some chocolate frogs from Peter, and a big book of advanced charms from Sirius. James had bought him a book too, Conjurer's Cartography, A Guide to Magical Map Making. Mr and Mrs Potter, however, had gone above and beyond, under the tree, he found more sweets, practical jokes, a beautiful set of quills, which he tried to give back. 
We got the same for James and Sirius, dear. Don't be silly. And a brand new pair of pyjamas. The Potter's extended family began arriving for Christmas lunch at about midday, as well as the Pettigrews, who brought with them Peter's elder sister, Philomena, and her muggle boyfriend she'd brought back from university. Remus was introduced to everyone as a friend of James, and generally ignored, except for one tiny and ancient wizard who was already red-nosed and merry from all of the drinks Gully was passing around. Lupin, you say? Not Lyle's Lupin's boy? Remus gaped, unable to answer. He'd only heard his father's name spoken once or twice. Um, yes, he said finally, blushing hard. Is he here? The wizard grinned, looking round. Excellent fellow. Haven't seen him in years. Uh, he's dead, Remus replied, with an apologetic shrug. Damn shame, the wizard cried, spilling some of his drink. Fine jeweller. Taught me everything I know about Bogarts. Temper did tend to get him in trouble, though. I told him not to mess about with that grey-backed chap. Bloody werewolves. Ought to exterminate the lot of them. Remus blinked. James looked at him, curiously. Fortunately, Mr Potter intervened. Darius, have another drink, old man. Leave the young people to their games, huh? Remus swallowed hard and returned to the gobstones tournament as if nothing had happened. 